This has been a great conference. Um, I just, I've gone to, like many of you, hundreds if not thousands of conferences. Um, we actually run our own conference at Define Health. It's called Cancer Progress. It's been running for about 26 or 7 years. Um, and it's actually devoted to the area that we spend most of our time in, which is cancer. Um, and, and when we actually acquired this meeting, we actually bought the meeting from the organizers probably six or seven years ago because we thought it was a wonderful meeting really focused on a key therapeutic area of progress that we're making against a disease that is a major concern of just about every human being. Um, the, the interesting thing about cancer progress is when we took it over, what we said was we want to make this more multifactorial. We want to break down the silos just within cancer because it was a very medical science heavy meeting. And so the first year, who did we bring in? Right at the first year we were on it, right at the height of the issue about market access and the cost of cancer drugs, we brought in some really important prominent people from the payer community to shake it up, okay? Over the years, we've brought in patient advo advo advocacy groups. For some reason, every time I try to say that word up here, I can't say it, okay. Advocacy groups. Um, we have brought in, um, we have brought in um, uh, foundations. Um, we have brought in, uh, for this year, we're having um, the Parker Foundation. If you know what Sean Parker is doing out there, it's pretty remarkable. So we've really broadened this, but now we're working backwards. The beautiful part about this meeting is you're starting from, 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 from the bones of it. I mean, you are starting from the skeleton of this and building onto it. And I think, um, so to Zan, to Thomas, to Julia, to the organizers, um, just phenomenal. So thank you for, and for the invitation. Okay, so um, I'm going to just very, very, oh, by the way, one apology. I said here yesterday while I was struggling with that word advocacy that I didn't think there was an advocacy group for type 2 diabetes patients, and I just met one. So I, I correct that statement, um, and, and thank you. That was a, a, a really interesting presentation and, and actually pulled out a lot of the reasons why we don't have advocacy. But if you missed what I said yesterday, what I said yesterday is one of the reasons we don't have advocacy is simply because it's a very big disease and because we, don't, we advocate to make people aware of things. Okay, um, and to do all those other things, but they very often begin with increasing awareness. So let me start and use that awareness as a, as a, as a transition theme here. And because um, I said, what can big pharma do and what can it not do? And, and I have a very simple answer to the question, and that's recognize and understand the opportunity, okay? Um, you know, how many people here are from a big pharmaceutical company? Raise your hands. That's not much. That's less than the rounding error. Uh, that's, that's tiny, okay? Um, you know, and maybe there were a few more here yesterday, um, but we need a lot more participation from Big Pharma because no matter how much we want to advance this, the Big Pharma, the Big Pharma seat at the table of this innovation ecosystem, whether they are innovators themselves is a matter of debate, but their access to capital, their access to global scale, their access to development expertise, and everything pretty much, it's hard to have a meeting like this and move it forward without Big Pharma. Um, and the, I'll tell you about, in a minute, I'll tell you about the other group that's not here in the room, and I'll prove it, I'll take another count. But I'm gonna, in the interest of, of time, and I don't have any, so I'm gonna actually just put up these slides and let you look at them, because you've basically seen them before, all right? You know, basically the fact that, you know, I tried to make this maybe a little, and by the way, courtesy of the Milken Institute, which does amazing work on this in the U.S., and these, these are U.S.-centric um, slides, um, just increase the numbers if you want to include Europe and Japan. Um, but if you, the focus here is not necessarily the, um, the, the, the population here, um, it's actually the rate of growth, the actual rate of growth between 2012 and 2050, that number, okay, of people over 85 will have tripled, okay? That's an astounding, okay? So we've all seen the data, all right? And, and just so you can focus on the opportunity, I think you all know about the burden, all right? Um, I think in um, some of the presentations this morning, there was an amazing slide. I think, Steve, you may have put it up on all the comorbidities, um, um, you know, that, that have been associated with aging. So that did a better job of this, so I can skip that. Um, you know, the impact of these conditions, um, you know, 
Um, you know, and again, we talk about diabetes. It's only 9.3% of adults with diabetes that only have diabetes. Okay, so if you want something that talks about metabesity, that's your metabesity take home number right now. Only 10% or less than 10% of diabetes, of adults who have diabetes, only have diabetes. They've got other problems, which makes this an issue. Um, and finally, just this idea of the, um, was talked about this morning, I think Jill from the nice side talked about um, long-term care um, and that not necessarily be some, being something in the public health service, um, but regardless of who's paying for it, and it's a bit of a mess as to who is actually going to pay for it, and the answer is if you don't know, it's probably you, um, but you know, it's going to cost an enormous amount of money, and again, remember, it's not just actual numbers here, it's percentage of increase. So here's what I think pharma can do direct R&D efforts appropriately. Now, I would ask you, is pharma directing the R&D efforts appropriately? Well, there were wonderful scientific presentations here yesterday that nobody from pharma, or almost nobody from pharma was here to see. Apologies to the few that raised your hands, and good for you. Um, but let me prove what the problem is a little bit. I'm gonna do this graphically. I'm gonna start this very simple slide by, um, by telling you that the bars that I'm going to put on represent the clinical agents reported to be in development in pharmaceutical company pipelines, okay? This is aggregate pharmaceutical company pipelines. Those are the number, okay, of clinical stage development assets. Now, you'll notice the line goes to cancer. Okay, I'm very happy that the line goes to cancer. It's a great thing for patients, it's a great thing for humanity, and frankly, it's a great thing for a consulting firm called Defined Health because that's a big business for us, okay? But and anytime um, I, I present this slide and I present the points going with this slide, some of the people who run our cancer practice, who are very important people, come to me and they say, um, please don't present that slide in again. Don't open your big mouth and, and say this. But the problem is the other areas, and let me just show you what those bubbles mean. The bubbles are actually the population, the rough population, okay, of the elderly population in the U.S. with chronic health conditions. So what this slide shows is a perilous misalignment between the priorities of the pharmaceutical industry. And I say absolutely perilous if you look at everything that we're talking about from the future, if you look at what Julia has presented, if you look at all of the presentations that we've heard over the last two days, okay? Um, if you heard about metformin this morning, if you heard yesterday about aging, if you heard about um, metabesity, um, all of this is, con is the, the constellation of all this is in this terrible misalignment. Now, I do a lot of work with pharma companies on strategy, I've presented to a lot of boards, and I always present this slide, okay? And every time I present this slide, somebody on the board says, wow. And guess what? Nothing ever gets done about it. Absolutely nothing ever gets done about it. And that's because of this, okay? It's because, and this is my last slide, it's because as we're starting, starting, and I don't mean this is a rough representation, um, as, you know, I don't mean to say the challenges of biology are ever going to go away, but we live in an era, and we live in an area, we live in a time, and I think this meeting is ample evidence of it, as we're starting to move the needle on some of those challenges to biology. But as we move the needle to those challenges of the biology, guess what? We haven't morphed the business model. We haven't changed the business model, okay? The biggest change in the business model in pharmaceutical industry has been a mix of selling drugs actually for, for large chronic conditions and focusing on their favorite obsession right now, which is orphan and rare diseases. Now, I don't mean to any way knock orphan and rare diseases. We also do a lot of work in orphan and rare diseases. The Orphan Drug Act did exactly what it was intended to and more. And patients are the great beneficiaries of that. But from a business model point of view, to have 7,000 drugs for genetically identified populations of, of, of rare genetic diseases, okay, that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
okay, is simply not going to add up when we look at the economic catastrophe, whether it comes from metabesity and whether neurodegenerative disease is a component of metabesity, we can talk about that. But, you know, just, just call it, let's just call it aging, okay, and, 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 and really leave it at that. So I'm going to... I'm going to, uh, you know, essentially stop there because I'm going to kind of do what Lucy Rose did yesterday, and I thought she did it so brilliantly, was to just tell you that there's a problem. And people very often say, Ed, you're really good at laying out the problems. What about the solution? And I say that wasn't covered in any rate, you know, I got for speaking here. So, um, you know, and I probably wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't be here. I'd be quietly investing. Um, but... But, you know, it's a dialogue that we have to have, and that dialogue's begun in this meeting. Now, the reason, and Joe's going to have his own spot, I asked Joe to come up here, and I just will probably just open up with a, with a couple of thoughts here in, in, in the time that I have, and then you'll be able to continue it Can later. Can you back up to the previous slide? Sure. Gladly. Yes. It, there is a rationality behind this, and mm -hmm. it's twofold. One, the model in the pharmaceutical industry is, is based on two principles. The first is the principle of predictability and the principle of at-risk capital. If you imagine an XY plot on which the Y axis is a range from zero to 100 percent and the X axis is time, imagine the curve that starts at near zero percent at time zero in terms of probability of approval and over time through the progressive accumulation of evidence approaches 100 percent as the regulatory authorities approve it. So you, you imagine that S-curve. If on that same graph you plot the curve of cumulative dollars spent, it takes a much longer time before the curve bends up and eventually captures the same essence. The difference between those two curves is value creation. And if you take the first derivative of those curves, when you look at a cost of dollar spent per risk unit reduction, the optimum point is in the middle of phase two. Now, why do I make that point? Because the risk reduction curve is different for each of these disease states. For cancer, it's a much more pronounced and defined risk reduction curve. Mm -hmm. Second, Larry, there's clear evidence that if you get it approved for any indication in cancer, it will find its way into every opportunity in cancer unlike almost every other disease, which is so narrowly controlled that if it's approved for this and this only, that's where it'll stay until you spend the next hundred million to get it expanded to patients without diabetes. So there is a very high degree of logical uh, interpretation here, and it's just looking at that first derivative of dollars spent per risk unit reduction, and it is very clear that the peak is in the cancer space right now right, and, me, and uh, in uh, orphan drugs. Yeah, now let me, let me ask you the question that I have with a show of hands. Anybody here from the venture capital community? Aside from the gentleman up here on the stage, okay, who is okay, a contrarian venture capitalist, if I've ever met one? I'm a contrarian, one, yes. Um, and is investing in areas and has over the course of his career not necessarily as a venture capitalist, but as an entrepreneur and a serial entrepreneur, has started and built two very successful companies focused on major diseases and raised the money for those companies and built those companies against pretty strong headwinds at the time, okay? But I think you'd even admit, Joe, that the headwinds that you face today, okay, in your company's pipeline, which has focuses. Now, Nash is a little bit trendy, as we heard from, from Brian this morning, but, but outside of that, there's some really, really unexciting, <laughs> you know, from, 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 from the investor point of view, right? There's, there's hypertension, there's obesity, there are all these things that are very big, important components of, of metabesity, right, and things we need drugs for. So I know you'll get a chance later to, you know, talk about that, but, but the focus here is really on, on business models, you know, and so, you know, part of what I'm concerned about is how we get more innovation into this space, okay? We have a lot of interest, all right? I should, we should have a lot more interest. Hopefully this starts to catalyze a lot more interest, um, but we don't have a lot of innovation. Okay, listen, what, what, what Nir and Steve and, 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 and Eric and, and the anti-aging, you know, leadership are doing 
is extremely important. What they're doing with a drug called metformin is extremely important, but I remind you that metformin is, what, 50 or 60 years old, okay? Um, and it's possible there are, there are better metformins out there, okay? In fact, it's highly likely that someplace, someplace, somebody's either got or can design a better metformin um, so that understanding what they're doing in that validation is extremely important. My concern is who's going to, not who's going to pay for it if we get it to the market. It'll almost be a nice problem to have, almost. I think that the problem is who's going to pay to fund it, to, to push it forward, and how do we, how do we catalyze the, the, the venture community here, because that's who you need to have a lot more at these, at these meetings, too, you know to the organizers, so. Uh, the venture community will respond to the degree that it is, perceives higher degree of certainty in a venture investment. If you look at the odds of success of starting a new compound into the pipeline, it's pretty small. Even entering uh, preclinical studies, it's less than 10%. In fact, the Tufts database suggests that a compound properly developed entering phase one has a 10% chance of probability of success. If that phase one is pro uh, successful, phase two has a 20 to 25 percent, depending upon the disease state. Interestingly, a compound properly developed with all of the associated support systems developed along with it, entering phase three trial has a 75 to 80 percent probability of success. That's a very investable proposition of failure risk mm -hmm. for the uh, venture community. Unfortunately, the cost of investing uh, uh, up to that phase three is not right. trivial. Right, right. And that's the problem with the business model. And well, I think we, yeah. we are going to have to see innovation uh, in, the ph in the pharma model. But I think it's particularly in this space, okay? Um, particularly, uh, there was some discussion of sarcopenia that, that arose the other day. I think, Zan, you brought it up. Um, and, you know, at Define Health, we like to try to think we're, we're slightly ahead of the curve on some of these things. Um, so we get out there and we talk about things just like you guys are doing, you know, uh, fields that are, you know, you, you want to be, you want to invest in early. And probably about seven or eight years ago, we actually um, gave a strategy briefing and we actually invited people um, to come and offered really nice free dinner and really good wine and, you know, and, and nobody came. Nobody came, nobody wanted to hear about sarcopenia, right? And then when we started to hear about it, you know what we heard? There's no endpoints, okay? The trials are really long, okay? Payers aren't gonna pay for it. Um, the value proposition isn't clear, okay? All of the same things I'm, I heard about sarcopenia seven or eight years ago, I'm hearing about aging, okay, today. Um, and, but it's not just about aging. It's about, frankly, and I'm probably going to close here from, from my remarks, it's about anything that affects a large population, to Joe's point, in which the proof of concept is only achieved after enormously expensive long-term investment, okay, and therefore brings that risk, the shift of the risk, back to a point where the attrition rate is indeed way too high, okay? So we've got a lot of things we've got to, we've got to talk about, but um, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm gonna, I probably can take one or two questions here, and then I'm going to really have to dash out because Heathrow doesn't wait, but um, yes. Hi. So I don't think so much industry is, is calling the shots. I think they're reacting to the rules that they've been given. Mm -hmm. So I blame Congress and the Food Drug Cosmetic Act in FDA and the Drug Safety Group, right. you know, I can understand why you wouldn't want to have a lot of elderly people in a hypertension trial, because mm -hmm. it doesn't take that many adverse events that just might be unbalanced due to bad luck yeah. to kill a drug. Yeah. I mean, Zelnor, yeah. which was a very good drug in the GI space, was taken off the market because of a meta-analysis that showed an excess of three non-fatal MIs yeah. in a meta-analysis. Yeah. Um, Zell, uh, Tassavri right. was taken off the market. Luckily, it was brought back right. through patient advocacy right. because of three cases right. of PML. Right. You know, Vioxx was taken off right. because of a controlled trial over three years and an excess of eight non-fatal MIs. So yeah. it's the tyranny of small numbers, yeah. and yet there are certain elements on the drug safety side that will do that, and some perfectly good drugs where the benefit 
outweigh the risk in the larger population were taken off because of that, I, that I, tunnel vision. I, I completely agree, and I think that's a, a, a great observation. And I'm going to make one that's going to come off a little weird, but I might as well leave you with something weird before I dash out of here. So, um, you know, Joe will tell you about his platform, and I, I know the platform of, of NewCert in particular is, is probably highly unlikely to have safety issues. Um, but I was sort of thinking in general about um, metformin, the controversy of metformin. Metformin's obviously a really, really safe drug um, with years and years and years of heritage and experience. But I was thinking about the background that, that I think Nir and, 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 and maybe Steve, the, the, the presentation about aging as a disease, okay? And if you look at the way aging actually is the core of the disease, you ask this sort of provocative question, and I don't expect the agency to ever really come around on this, but just from a provocative point of view, think about what would we tolerate? What, what sort of tox, not really, what, what sort of tox profile, safety profile would we tolerate in a drug, okay, that had the potential, okay, let's just dream now, that had the potential to eliminate, okay, or greatly reduce all of those chronic diseases, okay? Um, remember, we tolerated liver function elevations in statins, okay? And if we hadn't tolerated liver function elevations in statins, and presumably we tolerated them because we, they were mechanistically understandable, and really, but if we hadn't tolerated them, how many lives would have been lost? Because the FDA would have said, no, we don't trust the doctors to do the monitoring. As it turns out, almost nobody monitors anymore anyway. And you have an incredible class of drugs that saved all those lives. So I think from a, from a where do we learn from, you know, about these drugs used in large, maybe, and this is a horrible, I'm going to make a really controversial statement, maybe they don't have to die, and they shouldn't die, if they're not absolutely 100% exquisitely safe, okay? And, and I know, and then, you know, we can't use rapamycin, I get that, okay? But if we had a drug that was somewhere on the nastiness level between metformin and rapamycin, and had the efficacy that we'd like to see from some of these drugs, could we actually use that drug? So with that, I, I am going to have to run because, um, um, I should say British Air doesn't wait, but um, I thank you very, very much, and thanks for having me here. It's been a, it's been a really remarkable experience, and, and kudos to the organizers. And um, Joe, you get to take the baton, I guess, probably after lunch or in what's left of this session. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>